Well, hello friends. Welcome back to the program. Today we are going to do some performance analysis. So uh, I have this thing that I don't like on Serenity, which is that the JavaScript test suite that we have keeps taking longer and longer to run. And um, we have this test.js program that you can see it running here, has a little progress bar in the taskbar. And it just takes takes quite a while to run. Uh, there it's finished in 12 seconds. That's a cold run, of course. So nothing was cached. If we run again, we should get a slightly better result just because all of the libraries and uh, everything from disk has been paged in. Um, but yeah, so 11.3 seconds. And if we run the Linux build of test.js, uh, it is just significantly faster. You can see here, uh, it runs in just uh, under two seconds, so 1.9 something seconds. Um, and we have just a, a very large performance difference between uh, Linux and the Serenity kernel when it comes to running this program. And of course, there are other things than just the kernel that differ. We also use our own C library here, uh, which has our own malloc. Um, so there are a number of differences, but the huge difference here in, in runtime, uh, I would really like to know what's going on with that. And usually what I would do is I would use the uh, Serenity in-system profiler to, to capture a trace and so on. You've seen me do it many times, but today uh, I thought we would try something different. So I've seen this thing called QProfiler, which is supposed to be a QMU um, sort of a thing that connects to your QMU instance and just uh, samples whatever the um, machine, whatever the system inside of the QMU is doing at the moment. And um, I remember maybe a year ago, somebody tried to get this working for Serenity, but I, I don't know if they ever did. Um, so I thought that we could make that thing work today or at least try to so let's just clone wait that's not what i was looking for <laughs> um this is what i wanted all right so let's see what this thing does how do you use it um dot slash q profiler okay so you have to pass uh, a path to a socket and some arguments. Um, wait. Mm, how do we get QMU to create that socket, though? That's probably this thing. Okay. So let's tweak our QMU. Um, arguments so that uh, where's that list I think right here will be fine so that it creates this socket and yeah, we'll just do that okay and then if we run now does it create that thing okay so presumably QMP is like QMU management protocol or something. Um, and then now we want to run this thing. Okay, so um, that's in source. Q profiler, Q profiler. Okay, so it's doing something. Um, probably have to change this file name here. Getting a bunch of invalid access, and then we eventually fail. Yeah, right. Hello world, no such file. So let's specify our own kernel, I guess. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so the kernel. And can we make it? Let's change the um, duration to like one second. Okay. So now at least it fails faster. Um, 
And we're getting a lot of these invalid access errors. So I feel like this is what somebody got stumped on last time. Um, so I think the problem here is going to be related to um, the fact that these are um, virtual addresses. So our, our kernel um, is loaded at a very high virtual address. So we probably have to subtract the um, kernel base address somewhere. So let's just see how this how this thing is implemented. Um, okay, so it's Python, which I'm definitely not super familiar with. I have written some Python, but not much. Okay, so arguments parsing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, serve is a QMU monitor protocol. All right, so that's presumably the object that we use to speak to QMU. And then uh, for I in range R, I guess duration divided by frequency. So this is the number of samples that we want to take, I guess. And then, oh, I see. Okay, so we figure out how many samples do we want to take, and then we iterate that many times. And at the after each sample, we sleep for the frequency, which we were passing uh, 0 0.05, which I guess is 50 milliseconds. So it seems like a vaguely reasonable approach. And then what are we doing here? So do command. What is do command? Do command just sends a command to serve, which is that um, QMU monitor protocol. Was it protocol? Yeah, protocol. Okay, so it sends info registers, I guess. And then it gets back response, maybe? RSP sounds like it would be the stack pointer, but I, I think in this case they mean response. So can we like print out the response, see what it looks like? Okay, so I guess we're sending info registers and then we just get this big register dump uh, coming back over the um, uh, over that socket. Okay, and then we are doing a regex search for uh, the instruction pointer, RIP equals, which will find us this line right here. This is where we have the current instruction pointer, which matches those bogus accesses. Um, okay. And then RIP is the capture group one. So yeah, okay. So RIP here is our captured instruction pointer uh, from that regex. So let's just print that, see what comes out. Okay, so progress. These are our instruction pointers. And then uh, it sends another command, which is uh, XP EBP plus eight. So it's trying to get the current stack frame, I guess. So what do we do with that? We run it, run a regex on it, and then save that in RIP2, which is then used for nothing. Okay. So, well, it seems like this doesn't do anything, so let's just not do that. Um, and then so we have this problem now, right? That, that these things are not at the right offset. So what's the kernel base? Um, yeah, this is the, the kernel base that we use on x86-64. So I think if we just subtract this from the addresses, um, maybe everything would just start working. So RIP is a string right now. How do we turn that into 
How do we turn a string into a number in Python? String to int hex. Convert a hex string to int in Python. Okay. Um, oh, I see. So if we had a prefix that was like ox, then it would figure it out by itself. But because there isn't one, we have to specify the base. But uh, that seems really simple. So let's say, let's call this rip string. And then rip is int rip string, comma, uh, 16. Okay, so these are now um, numbers. That's fine. And then finally, we should subtract the base that wait the base that we're using here. So that and um, how do we print something hex? Print hex Python. <laughs> <laughs> print hex python how do you do the hex function oh you just do like that oh sweet okay okay um that's pretty cool okay so we have those and do we want to convert it back into a string Wait, how is this used later? Rip. So we keep it in a hash. I guess this is like remembering how many samples we had at this particular uh, instruction pointer. And then we do an adder to line for every remembered instruction pointer <laughs> for i and rip hash. OK, and then i is being passed verbatim to uh, adder to line, but I think adder to line expects a hexadecimal thing, but we can probably just do this then. That seems okay. Um, okay, so one of these is not like the other. We got this guy right here, which does not look like a valid instruction pointer. Hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. because because um, we are just capturing the RIP, like the instruction pointer register from the CPU, whatever it is. So if we are running in the kernel, then we will be above that address. But if we are running in user space code, uh, we will not be there. So I guess we can just do something like um, if rip is less than this number colon um, continue. Yes, I Pythoned. Okay. Um, so we're starting to get something that looks like maybe a little bit like a like a profile. Um, these are mangled C++ symbols. Can we just get adder to, so they're using adder to line, like they're kind of shelling out to adder to line and then expecting that to, um, just print something nice, but adder to line has demangle. So let's use that. Demangle. Um, okay. Look at that. So now we are getting nice C++ looking names. 78%. <laughs> These are not sorted. Oh, that's fine. Um, so let's see if we can, let's get rid of that print that we had. We're printing the rip. We don't need to see those anymore because it's working. And this output is kind of messy. It says like <laughs> percent of time function name at a bunch of question mark and then like has been executed. So has been executed seems like completely like, I don't need that. <laughs> um, also, I guess I don't super care about like percent of time. Can we do sample counts instead? 
So that would just be like, wait, do we just do this? Because rip hash name for I would have the, uh, the raw sample count, I guess. And then, let's see. Okay, starting to look kind of cool. Um, and then, um, the formatting here is irritating. So I don't know how to do format strings in Python. Right, justified number Python. Uh, okay, use f string syntax to write a line number. F string syntax. Wait, I don't know if I'm in the right place. This looks like something I would have written in uh, in uh, QBasic when I was a very young man. Okay, let's see. This looks more familiar. So um, you would have something like colon like this for eight uh, spaces. And then you would pass in the thing. Can we do something like that? That was not quite right. Oh, dot format. Oh, okay, okay. My bad. Hmm. Okay. Um, so the file name part here is kind of useless. Adder to line. Can you get adder to line to like skip the file name? Mm, show function names. Nah, well, it's not the end of the world. Although these, um, Dwarf errors are irritating. <laughs> Subprocess check output. Can you redirect standard error with that thing? Subprocess check output there. Um, yeah, this sounds like what I want. Just tell subprocess to redirect it for you. Pass stdr dev null. Okay. Um, let's see. Stdr dev null. Am I doing this right? Oops. I'm probably um, writing very hackish Python at the moment, but it totally worked. All right, and then um, I think we can just sort dash n at the end, and that should ensure that uh, we're always sorting by samples counts. <sighs> okay, so let's see if this thing actually works. What about we just... Um, like capture while it's running test.js. <laughs> Get a couple of these. Oh, I guess these are not so many samples because we're only running for a second. So let's run for five seconds and um, can capture like way more samples. So frequency is not spelled correctly here, but uh, let's just ignore that. <laughs> uh, all right. So what are we getting here? So these are, so we don't get stacks here. Like we only get the instruction pointer at every sample opportunity. So 
uh, we don't get like we don't get the full clear picture of what's going on, but we do get to sample the uh, currently executing function, which um, can probably tell us something. So what we can see right here in this particular capture is that uh, we have the highest number of samples in memory manager kernel region from virtual address. That is the place where we spend the most amount of time or like that's the place where we are caught red handed the most number of times, like specifically in that function. So seems interesting. Let's see. Let's see what we can do about that. So kernel region from virtual address. Um, right, so we uh, okay, so this is used I think um, when you get a page fault, for example, so you have a the CPU tells you that you have a fault and it gives you an address, and then it's up to our memory manager code to figure out okay, well, what's supposed to be at that address, uh, and then page something in. And first thing we need to do in our code is to figure out what is the sort of higher level memory region object that's responsible for this address. And as you can see here, we do that by just iterating through all of our kernel regions and checking if each one contains that address. And if so, we return that region. And uh, this is obviously um, O of n. So we'll run in linear time, which is not great. And uh, uh, we I think that's probably a vector. No, it's um, an intrusive linked list. Um, but I think we should be able to replace this with a um, red black tree because we we already use a red black tree for uh, for user space memory regions. So this is specifically for kernel regions. So like memory that's inside the kernel only memory area. If you look at the address space class, um, it has a red black tree for managing uh, regions here. So each process address space already uses red black tree, which has uh, logarithmic time for um, for lookup. So let's try to switch it out. So I think one little thing to know here is that the uh, the address space for, for user space memory, the address space object owns the regions contained within, whereas in kernel code, uh, regions are owned by um, own putter objects. So around the kernel, you'll find like these random own putters to a region. Um, not the case for uh, user space regions, but the case for kernel regions. So this is a weekly owning intrusive list at the moment. So we are going to need a weekly owning red black tree. So what were they using flat putter? I think flat putter to uh, we'll use flat putter to region star. Okay. And let's see what we do with this M kernel regions. So this code here, instead of iterating through the entire set of regions, what we would do instead is then um, there's an API. I always forget what it's called. Um, M kernel regions find largest not above. There we go. Um, find largest not above virtual address. And if that's not a hit, if we don't have one, oh, that's a putter putter, actually. <laughs> it's kind of a, yeah, the, the API is a little bit awkward, but uh, it is, I don't know how to make it better. So, okay. Uh, but if we do have a region there, then region putter, I guess, like, Wait, no, no, this should work. 
Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that looks really nifty, actually. Okay, so that would be O of log n. Worst case performance. And then we probably have a bunch of other situations that use M kernel regions that we now have to change because um, it's not a, an intrusive list anymore. So we don't have a pend, for example. We have, is it set? Nope. Insert? Yes. Uh, oh, and we need a key. So that would be region batter get. And to remove something, I guess we have to probably pass in the key, right? So yeah, so the virtual address of the region is what we pass in here. And that has to be a pointer coming in. Great. Um, and then here, um, those are now, oh, so wait, this is just a dump function that like dumps out all of the kernel regions. So in that case, we just need to switch those to, um, to arrows is what I'm trying to say, but we can also do something like this. I don't know. Maybe that's okay. Less uh, changes. So see if that works. I feel like this is one of those things that that like I, I've been meaning to do forever, but I just keep forgetting about. And I mean, it's been a long time since I even thought about this. But the fact that it is um, the place where we spend where we are caught red-handed the most number of times in this profile is probably a sign that we should do something about it. So um, obviously using a better data structure is, um, is one of those wholesome things that is just kind of obviously a good idea, but let's see if it actually improves anything. Uh, and, and of course, let's see <laughs> that the code actually works. I do you think I got it right? Um, we'll see. Okay, we're up and let's run test.js. Well, it's chugging along at least, not crashing. And we completed in 10 seconds, cold. So that already seems like a relatively large improvement, actually. First cold run was about 12 seconds. Ooh, look at that. Uh, hot cached, we are down to 9.3 seconds. So um, it's actually quite a substantial improvement. Super awesome. Um, so let's, let's just commit that because this is obviously a good thing. Um, kernel switch uh, store kernel uh, memory regions in a red black tree this um, we were already doing this for user space memory regions in the memory address space class um, so let's do it for kernel regions as well. This um, gives a nice speed up on test.js and probably basically everything else as well. Yes, that's super cool. Um, Okay, so let's um, let's capture again using our Q profiler thing. I guess we will just um, start this thing and then run this thing. And you know, it's not an exact process that we're doing here. Just uh, sampling a little bit. And then I guess now we're just waiting for it to crunch 
through. And yeah, as you can see, that function is just gone from the top. The, um, what was it called? Um, kernel region from virtual address. Kernel region from virtual address, right? Is that even in here? It is not. So um, kick ass. OK. And then now the top one is bitmap view. Find next range of unset bits. Um, I think that's probably um, the kernel heap allocator. So the kernel heap allocator uses this to, f it's like, um, it's a first fit malloc that we use in the kernel. And uh, it uses, uses this API. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible that it's doing something silly. Uh, it's a kind of an overly complicated implementation of this thing. Um, but I, okay, this is not the day to write a new malloc, I think. So let's just kind of ignore that one. Um, what else is up here? So spin lock locker destructor. Okay. Spin lock locker, which um, templated to recursive spin lock. So I'm guessing that this is, gets inlined here. Recursive spin lock unlock. Uh, yes, this gets inlined. So it's probably all of this code right here uh, where we have uh, atomic load, atomic store, and a whole bunch of gunk. So um, it's probably some way to, to streamline this as well, but it seems vaguely forgivable at the moment. And here is just a raw atomic primitive, compare exchange strong. Um, interesting that that's even showing up. But uh, that's often the case. More spin lock locker. OK, flush TLB local. OK, so TLB flushes are, I mean, there's a fact of life when you are doing a kernel. You have to flush the TLB, but is it doing something silly? Um, OK, so it has a loop. And we, okay, so we get, the way the flush TLB API works is that we get an address and a number of pages that we're supposed to flush the TLB for starting at that address. So then we just loop uh, through the page count here. And um, this looks, there's nothing obviously wrong about this to me unless um, unless there's like a better instruction to use or something. Uh, but it, this, it feels like the kind of thing that would just, it's just bound to be expensive. Hmm. All right. And then physical region return page. Okay, so that's when we are deallocating a physical page because it's no longer used. Why might that be slow? Okay, well, we have a fix me. Okay, so find a way to avoid looping over the zones here. Mm -hmm. So it seems like my past self was predicting that my current self <laughs> would eventually come here uh, and need a hint about what to do about this. It's funny when you when you write like a little note for your future self, and then you find it and you're like, thanks, man. I appreciate that you thought of me. So um, past Andreas suggests that we should do some math on the address to find the right zone index. The main thing that gets in the way of this is uniform, non-uniform zone sizes. Perhaps it would be better if all zones had the same size. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is about uh, our physical memory allocator. And the way that the allocator works is that it takes it enumerates all of the physical memory that we find on boot. Uh, and then it um, chunks it up into regions. So we can see right here, uh, we have a user space memory physical region, 
um, which starts at this physical address, ends at this physical address, has this size, and we chunk it up into uh, what we actually what we call physical zones. So we have 60 physical zones of 16 megabytes each, and then we have 10 physical zones of one megabyte each. And the reason that we end up with that distribution is because uh, we didn't have enough for another 16 megabyte zone here. So um, I think we're pr just preferring to chunk it into 16 megabyte zones. And then for the remainder, we just chop it into zones of one megabyte each. And what my past self was saying in this comment is that this gets in the way of using some simple math here because what we end up doing instead is in order to return a physical page. So we have an address of a physical page that we're giving back to one of these zones. And in order to find the appropriate zone, we have to iterate through all of the zones, check if the zone contains the physical address, which is just a um, pointer compare. And if it does contain it, we deallocate the address into that zone. But I'm guessing that this loop here is what is making us show up at all. Um, so what if, what are the, what, is, what are the options here? So um, as I was saying here, perhaps it would be better if all zones had the same size. So what that means is that um, we would sort of uh, ignore these the um, 10 me um, 10 zones of one megabyte each so 10 megabytes here would go to waste because we couldn't chop it into a 16 megabyte zone and we would just tolerate the um, lost memory here uh, that does seem a little bit sad I guess like uh, 10 megabytes uh, not not having those 10 megabytes available to allocation just completely lost seems like silly so that would be unfortunate but I guess something we could do is we could um, we could remember how many f of these full-size zones that we have and in the common case we will be somewhere within this set so we could do a simple address math to find the zone index here and if we're outside of that uh, we could fall back to iterating through the remainder of the zones um, that might be an, an compromise that we could do. So that seems like something we could do, right? Um, so how are these set up? Initialize zones. Oh man, when did I write this code? It feels like it was recently, but it was in July. Okay. So, well, it's almost half a year ago. Okay. Okay, make zones, pages per zone. Right, first we make 16 megabyte zones with um, 4096 pages each, and then we divide any remaining space into one megabyte zones with 256 pages each. So quite descriptive, although the way that the argument here is form formulated as a page count rather than a megabyte count makes it a little bit um, less obvious how it works, but the comment makes up for that. Um, Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so what is the thing I want to express down here? I guess it's, um, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I want to compute a full size zone index, which would be, um, the physical address that we have coming in, which is the address that we are returning to the page allocator. Uh, patter get minus the lower address of this physical region. Yes. Okay, so now we have an offset into the physical region. Um, and then we can divide that by um, page size, which gives us a page index into the full size zone into the into the physical region. Okay. Um, and then we want to divide that by uh, full size zone page count or pages per full size zone. Okay. 
And then let's, um, let's just put these here. Pages per full size zone, 4096. Um, That seems, or or we could also like say small zone size is one megabyte, large zone size is sixteen megabyte. Um, forgive me for saying MB instead of MIB. Uh, yeah, so let's take the opportunity here to make this a little bit more descriptive. Uh, so large zone size and small zone size. Uh, and then that's pages per zone, which is now um, zone size. Size D pages per zone is zone size divided by page size. So a little bit of math there. Shouldn't be too complicated. Um, okay, so now we have pages per full size. Large um, zone page count pages per large zone. Um, maybe I don't need this actually then, I just need to divide it by large zone size. Yeah, okay. And then if full size zone index is um, Wait, how do we know how many of these we have? Do we have a size? What is that? Is that the total size of the allocator? In pages. Okay. So. Hmm. Um, wait, what else do we have here? We have the zone size and pages. So how do we know how many large zones we have? Uh, that would be <laughs> large zone size divided by page size, right? So Um, yes, I think that should be, then it should indeed contain that address. So zone is M zones at full size zone index. And then we can just deallocate the block and we don't have to loop through them. Okay. Otherwise, we do have to loop, but um, we could start the loop later. So we'll um, ah, so we could start the loop at large zone count. Um, something like that. Okay, and then we should definitely end up finding it. So this is, um, okay, <laughs> I feel like I, I very likely got something wrong in the math here. Um, but basically, if, if we are within the first couple of zones that are full sized, um, we can just do simple arithmetic to compute the index into the zones vector. And that uh, allows us to skip looping. 
in the common case, which should be faster, I would imagine. Um, so return page. Be interesting to see if that disappears from this thing. And also interesting to see if it um, makes test.js run faster. It doesn't seem like a bad idea in general to avoid looping if possible. So seems like it runs. 9.6, not bad. Um, okay, 9.2, hot. So, ah, uh, no, nothing, nothing amazing here, but um, 8.995, ooh, look at that. Numbers starting with eight, very cool. Um, let's try to just capture a profile and see if we can see Mr. Return Page, Mr. Physical Region Return Page. Let's just do that. Return Page, not a single one. So that's pretty cool. Basically, we were able to just get rid of it from, or at least, I mean, Obviously, this is not very precise or exact, but we went from four um, hits to zero hits or zero samples, which I would say is an improvement. And, you know, doing arithmetic instead of looping is probably a good idea. So um, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is a good idea and we should keep it. Return page, no return page. Um, that is good. What is this? HPET read main counter. Update time schedule. Read main counter. So that's the um, that's the system timer. They are high precision event timer. I think it stands for HPET. High precision event time. Yes. Yeah, so that's what we're using to drive our scheduler. And um, it's like the timer chip that we use. So it's kind of weird that we're spending so much time just reading the, um, I mean, reading like the current clock, essentially. Why are we doing that so much? Let's... Um, Let's investigate. Read main counter. Okay, so uh, we have two paths here. If it's a 64-bit counter, then we call some 64-bit function. Otherwise, we do a 32-bit read, I suppose. So um, let's find out if it's a 64-bit or 32-bit the one that we're using so that we can um, it's going to be very spammy but I mean I just want to find out uh, which path we're taking here <laughs> 64 bit okay okay so whoever's calling us we call read register safe 64 um, wait, what is this? As per 247, this reads to 64-bit value in a consistent manner using only 32-bit reads. Um, but what if I'm on a 64-bit CPU? Does this even matter? 247. I'm assuming it's like a section in the spec issues related to 64-bit timers with 32-bit cpus mm -hmm. um, a 32-bit timer can be read directly using processors that are capable of 32-bit and 
64-bit instructions. However, a 32-bit processor may not be able to directly read a 64-bit timer. A race condition comes up if a 32-bit CPU reads the 64-bit register using two separate 32-bit reads. Uh, sure. But what if we are on 64-bit? Then I think we don't need this, right? Because we can just do a single 64-bit read. Um, so we can just do like um, this is like specifics to to i386, and otherwise we would just um, oh we have to um, let's do something like anonymous union with anonymous struct. Um, Something like like this. Then I can just do reg dot full. Wait, because yeah, because like we don't need to worry about um, if since we have a sixty four bit CPU in this case, we don't need to worry about. Um, the race condition when you can only read 32 bits of the timer value at a time. So actually, if you look at what we what we do here on 32 bit is that like we read part of the timer value, and then we loop until uh, we're able to read the second part with the first part still intact. I think that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, if new high is high, then break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, um, we do a loop here until we're able to do a con consistent read of both parts, but none of that matters on 64-bit CPUs, which is what I'm using here. So wonder if that will make HPET read main counter drop to nothing as well. Cause I mean, certainly this is a much simpler piece of code, um, than this. So. probably validate that the generated assembly um, produces a single 64-bit read. Read register save 64. Um, wait, how do I do that? Read register save 64. Or maybe it's folded into read main counter, actually. This probably is a read main counter. Okay, HPET read main counter. Um, wait, why is there so much going on here? Oh, yeah, right. It's all of this stuff here in case it's a, not a 64 bit counter. But if, if it is a 64 bit counter, so we come in up here, uh, da, 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 test for that. Otherwise, if it is 64 bit, then jump to here. So B52, go here. Mm -hmm. And then we're calling to somewhere. Um, hmm. Well, either way, let's just see, let's just, let's just sample it. So it's not like magically faster, at least. 9.82 seconds, sure. That's cold. Eight point nine six two. Okay, so 
dipping comfortably into the 8.9 ish range. That's pretty nice. 9.0. Okay, okay. So let's do a capture here. So see what it comes up with. Okay, so it moved up to here. We were previously had four samples. Now it's down to two. Uh, of course, again, this is not a very <laughs> precise science, but it does seem like a fairly reasonable thing to do. Uh, I mean, like the change itself seems super obviously good because this is not a concern on 64-bit. Um, Although maybe we should express it the other way around, just to that might might look a little bit more um, understandable. <laughs> yeah, I th I think that's that's like a good change. So let's uh, commit that kernel. Um, read 64 bit HPET um, value um, simplify. Uh, let's see, simplify 64 bit HPET reads. We don't have to worry about. Um, Uh, da, 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 um, racy 32 bit reads when we're reading the 64 bit HPAT value using a 64 bit CPU. Yes, well, that's, that's a nice change. And then, yeah, so Let's do that um, physical memory zone thing. Kernel um, make physical region return page use do uh, arithmetic instead of loop. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, in the common case, we hmm. most of the time we will be returning or freeing physical pages within the um, full size, uh, full sized zones. So we um, and we can can do um, some simple math to find the right zone immediately instead of looping through the zones, checking each one. Um, we still loop. Uh, we still we still do loop through the. Um, slack slash remainder zones the end that's probably an even nicer way to solve this but um, this is already a nice improvement yeah okay I wonder if we can can we like capture even more of these like take it down to because really I just want like a lot of samples so that we can just kind of get a better picture of what's going on uh, it would be cool to make it do uh, whole stacks though but then you would have to walk the you have to walk the stack um, and for that to work correctly you also have to pause the CPU because otherwise you would get like 
like random unrelated things. So you'd have to completely pause the CPU, capture the RIP, the stack pointer, and then walk the stack backwards, um, you know, and, and sort of reconstruct the call stack that way. But it's probably doable. But um, I think today we're going to be happy with what we have here. Still, I still found some really nice things using this technique. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm doing this the wrong way. Okay. Let's see. So now I'm capturing lots and lots of samples, hopefully. Every two milliseconds for five seconds should be a lot of samples. Um, I should be able to compute that in my head, but uh, let's uh, use the power of tools. So 2,500 samples. I wonder if it actually is able to capture that many using this uh, QMP protocol. I feel like there's probably some amount of overhead. Um, and maybe what we're going to end up getting now is like um, a bunch of samples in the in the idle idle task or whatever idle loop, because I don't know. I, I feel like it's not very fast at capturing samples somehow. I suppose we could um, we could run this in a loop and capture that way in case it just falls out to idle. Now it's just taking forever. What are you doing? Oh, wait, here it comes. Okay, well, we didn't go out to idle, so that's great. Um, spin lock locker, sure. That's the allocator, TLB flush. Um, allocate committed user physical page. So page allocation is pretty heavy. Hmm, nothing super obvious here, really. But probably all of these things are worth looking into. Uh, but now I've done a whole bunch of them, and I feel like we should probably wrap it up. So um, let's see. Maybe what I should do is I should uh, fork this thing and just push my um just push my little changes that i made so that we can have them in case somebody wants to play with this i will just push it to here um Um, make this work for Serenity OS x86-64. Yeah, uh, so I'll just I'll just push that up and shout outs to um, to Matias Vara who created this Q profiler thing. Very neat. Um, good thing I I think we can probably. We can probably make all kinds of improvements to this, but at least now we have something basic that works and we can build on top of that. Seems like a potential is strong here. So git push mine master, I guess. Yeah, there we go. And right, and then you need this stuff if um, I think I'll, I'll just make that. Wait, what are you mad about? Oh, Freaking shell check. Um, I'll just make this. We we can just run with the QMP socket on. That seems fine. This allows external connections to the QMU monitor via QMP. Um, okay, 
So that was a nice little set of changes that we found in this nice little way. So I think this will be it for today's video. Uh, if you made it this far, then I thank you for watching and for hanging out. Um, I uh, hope you saw something interesting today. This was a very fruitful little session, I would say. I really enjoyed what we were able to do. And certainly, we improved TestJS runtime quite a bit here. We started at, what was it, 12 seconds cold, 11 seconds hot, or something like that. And we've been in the nines, dipping even into the eights at sometimes. Um, and surely, there is a lot more stuff to find here. Uh, and also, 8.8, .8, that's really juicy. Um, of course, the Linux version was running in less than two seconds. So obviously, we have a long way to go and a lot of problems to figure out on stuff. Still, you got you to gotta be happy about the little wins. And I'm happy about this one. So um, thank you very much for hanging out. And I will see you all next time. Bye.